You're listening to Blackset Radio with on air personalities in Costa Rica, Panama, Mexico, and Tanzania. Playing smooth jazz, quiet storm, RB, reggae, and the very best talk 24 7. So this is Terry from Panama, and again, I'm in the beach area. Um, in Atlanta, a decent two-bedroom, two-bath apartment um, is probably twelve to fifteen hundred or more. That the prices just keep going up and Anymore. going up. More like two thousand to twenty-five hundred. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, I mean the prices are really going up. I was able here to move into a, a nice high rise, two bedroom, two bath, directly on the ocean um, with mountain views and all that beautiful. And um, before I purchased, I was renting for eleven fifty a month. I mean, in Atlanta, I don't know what eleven fifty a month would even get me anymore. So um, I, I find that um, the cost of living is very reasonable. As far as food is concerned, um, there are a lot of expat restaurants and a lot of Panamanian restaurants. And the same for grocery stores. There are a lot of Panamanian items and a lot of items that brand name items that we as expats might buy. And so I think as far as shopping and eating, it's going to depend on what you want. You know, if you want to eat at an expat restaurant, it's probably going to be similar price to what you would pay. Um, in the States. Um, but if you are willing to purchase Panamanian type items in the stores, and if you are willing to eat in Panamanian restaurants, then it is much, much cheaper. So um, it's closed now. But when I first moved here a year and a half ago, the, um, there was a block away from me, a Fonda, which is what they call a typical Panam Panamanian restaurant. For breakfast, it was $3.50. For lunch, it was four twenty-five, and this is for a full meal. So, you know, the prices can be very reasonable if that's what you, you know, want. You have to make the decision. So, right. I agree with um, what Terry said about most of the things. Um, one thing that this is Jay, also from Panama. One thing that I um, had to learn was I, I came there with the expectations of like, you know, I heard people saying you can get something for $700 a month and and you can absolutely get that. And I had to put it in perspective of this, just how you want to live. And so when we came back to the city and we started looking at places and my wife was like, I'm not paying $1,200 or $1,300 a month, but the perspective of it is would you be able to get this view, get get all of these amenities for that amount of money, you know, where we came from? Um, so that was how I had to kind of look at it. But one thing that I did not know that I wish I would have known <laughs> before I got to Panama was that it's very important to have energy efficient appliances um, and air conditioning units. Um, I, I didn't know, I did not know that I need to have inverter units. I didn't know any of these things. And so when we got our first power bill, it was a lot, um, a lot, a lot. <laughs> like, um, and I think Will and I were kind of talking about that today. Um, and, and it was a lot, like, come on, give it up. Okay. Um, like $800 I, had, a lot. Yeah, we had one month was $900. Yeah. And so we just moved out of that apartment because the landlord refused to upgrade the appliances. So when I told him, I said, you know, these air conditions are 20 years old. This this refrigerator looks like it's been here since the building was been, like he we were only paying twelve hundred dollars a month for a beautiful view, big two thousand square foot apartment. All of that was great. But he said, well, I'm not going to do anything about it. And I said, well, I'm leaving. <laughs> so we just moved into 
another unit, much better building, a little bit more expensive, but that was the one thing we made sure when we went through, we need to make sure that everything in there is, um, you know, energy efficient and that it's inverter because before we left, we had to pay a $1,900 power bill mm. before we left. Mm. So that's something that I wish I would have known that I, I just didn't know. Well, I'm going to say amen. Mercy. I'm, I'm going to say amen to that. This is this is Big Will from Panama. So another perspective to throw in here is we spent the first year at the beach and now we're in the city. The power bill was much less at the beach. Uh, and it could be because of the energy efficient appliances, but I think it's mostly because we were able to leave our windows open and have that breeze cool the apartment and it's a lot less humid out there. Now, Panama City, you know, Jay is right. We just got our first power bill from our new apartment today. So I was like, huh? <laughs> what the... Uh, <laughs> And How much? Was, you know I'm nosy. What right. was it? <laughs> uh, it's, it's close to a Jeep because it's for two months, number one. <laughs> That's the thing. Uh, but apparently our consumption has been at just about $500 per month. And we have central air units here. It's, there's two units, one for one side of the uh, apartment and one for the other side of the apartment. And you know That's the city's a game changer. It, it is, yeah. it is, it is. So we're 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 at the beginning stages of what Jay just went through. <laughs> and, and tell also Charlotte one thing that we didn't know. Oh, we we researched this now. We can we could preach this because my wife was going through the bill trying to figure out exactly how they were computing what it. What happened? <laughs> so we found out that they bill on tiers. So if you consume three hundred and fifty or less, you get like a concession from the government for your bill. If you go above 750, they bill you like twice as much as what somebody that did 350 did. Like it's like they're penalizing you for using the electricity. I have a question. Does anyone know what type of power Panama uses? How I don't know, but it's a lot more than I pay here. I, listen, y'all got my heart. I mean, I thought I thought ours was a lot at 120. No. Yes. So well, listen, it's not like that for everyone. Like that's what that's Will. When I was talking to Will, we, I think we were at brunch or something, and I was quizzing the whole table. Like, well, how much is your bill? How much is your bill? And most people saying like an average of like sixty to one hundred dollars a month. My next door neighbor who never burns his air at the time, he's like, look at my bill. It's thirteen dollars. And I'm like, well, what is wrong with us? My cleaning lady's bill was five dollars. I was so concerned when she moved to a bigger house. I said. You got to make sure you can afford the utilities. Just ask them how much the utilities was. I kept drilling it over mm -hmm. and over. She don't have no washer and dryer. You know what I mean? Different things like that. For her, she said, mama, it's $5 a month. I'm like, what? <laughs> and yeah. guys, if I could just chime in here for one second, Ocean and Khalil are here now. And guys, Welcome, we're, <laughs> we're Welcome. talking about the cost of living uh, versus the cost of living in the United States. And we'll go on from there. So you guys can just jump in, but that's where we are now. Sorry, um, sure that's not D.L. Hughley. <laughs> oh, 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 no. I think we got D.L. Hughley don't on get the him, show. Don't get him started. <laughs> <laughs> don't. I don't know. Um, I wanted to say the other thing with the cost of living is with our rental, our friend was married to a Tico. He inquired on our behalf and he settled got the rate settled on so we do have a much lower rent price because we didn't get gringo priced so um when we first moved our rent was 500 dollars a month and um, we're on seven acres with million dollar views it's a small house it's just like a two-bedroom house but lots of land it's private it's secluded it's beautiful and that included groundskeeping we found the groundskeeper to be kind of creepy and I have a daughter, so we got rid of him. And they said, well, if you wanna hire your own groundskeeper, you can take $100 off of the rent and do that. So we pay $400 and people are always like, well, why don't you just buy? It doesn't make sense. The price of this property is like, um, I think he had it priced at 500,000. We could live here for 30 years and never reach that amount of 
money. And then if, if he's, I mean, and people have come up to look at it, but there's so many things that would need to happen for him to sell it. And like right now we're in a three-year lease and they have to give us so much time if they do sell it, but he, he's not trying to sell it. He's holding onto this property. So um, the other things for people coming to Costa Rica, if you're able to find somebody to negotiate for you, instead of going yourself, present a local face, that seems to help with um with getting ways. with getting a, a fair not i won't say fair but just getting a better price getting priced like the locals would get priced versus getting priced when they know that you're coming from the united states well let this me just say thing. some okay go ahead i'm sorry Samantha. i just wanted to make a um quick note about the three-year lease so it's standard when you're paying well it's standard for all leases in costa rica to be three years long and if you're paying in US dollars, that rate is locked in. It does not lock the renter in, it's more for your protection. So you can opt out of the lease after the first year, but your landlord cannot raise your rent for three years if you're paying in US dollars. Yeah, he actually, we've been on the same rate since we moved. Like we've renewed our lease twice. So the first time it was a year, the second time it was a year. And then the third time we did it for three years. I guess he realized, well, I guess they're gonna stay. So um, on time, on time payments are enticing to, you know, <laughs> landlords, you know, landlords that don't have to worry about getting their money. You know, that that's a plus. Let me just say this and then let's bring Khalil and Ocean into the conversation. Um, in Panama, there is Hubalada. So, Terry, do you get a discount on your electric? Um, Terry from Panama. Right. I do not. And that's my fault because I just haven't gotten around to taking my um, um, card um, to, you know, to change it. But I have gotten a number of um, discounts as a as a jubilado or a retiree. So um, anytime you leave um, the country of Panama, you can get 25 percent off your air. Um, you get um, discounts on doctors, on pharmacy, um, movie theaters, restaurants. Um, so I think that that's one of the things that Panama has that makes it really enticing for retirees is that we get really good discounts on a lot of things. And they, I mean, I, they, they really appreciate their seniors. Um, when I went to get my driver's license, there were two lines of about 10 people each, but then the guard took me over and put me in a separate line and there were two windows open. And when somebody left one of the windows, I was just standing there and the people in the other one were like, come on, come on. So as, as a retiree, you get to, you know, go ahead in line. You get your own line. You special lines. Right. And so yeah, I really right do. In Costa Rica. Yeah. Same I like that. You know, we get in the line try to get in the line the Ticos come and get in front of us. It's like, no, wait, we're old. What? <laughs> I guess they don't think we're as old as <laughs> they are or something, so. And, and for pregnant people, I was pregnant here. Um, I was pregnant, I had the experience of being pregnant in both the United States and in Costa Rica. Yes. Amazing to be pregnant in Costa Rica. It's so different than anything I had. I'd never been treated with so much like respect in my life. I've like, never seen the parking spaces for pregnant women where they actually had the stork, the the, yes. the stork was the, the stork, right? They have a stork in the in the parking space and it's for pregnant pregnant women. I said US don't care. <laughs> so <laughs> how do you guys how do you guys look alike? I'm sorry. And the DL Hughley look alike. <laughs> nah. <laughs> no, I don't know how I feel about no. that. No. <laughs> look, 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 baby, Dale Hughley is fine. Just uh, understand that, okay? Okay. okay. The ocean's a dancer. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> yes, roll the tape. <laughs> so, what form of dance, Ocean? I'm sorry. Uh -huh. What form of dance? Any kind. Uh, any kind. <laughs> How, my husband and I, I asked because that? my husband and I, um, we taught Latin ballroom when we were in the States. Oh, no, 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 not on that level. Party no. like, <laughs> more like club music. Yeah, modern, party dance. <laughs> modern dance. Yeah. House, house. Oh, yeah, house, house party, music yeah. all night long. Girl, I'll house you. What? <laughs> <laughs> 
So, but real, real quickly, since they touched on black men in Costa Rica, Will, do you want to um, chime in on black men in Panama? That's yes. how Will made his. This is how Will became to be Big Will and Black sure. to, to, to Panama. One yes. second before we move on, can I just chime in on the electricity? Uh -huh, I just, sure. I just want to make one point about um, like just sustainability and solar power in Costa Rica. So I live in a, um, a high rise that's 60% solar powered. And so my light bill last month was $20 and this month is $30. And we're wow. washing clothes every day, cooking. <laughs> do you have do you have central air or do, do they have the units on the wall? So we don't have AC because San Jose is typically in the 70s. So you don't really yeah. need. And well, so that's get, a big, that's a yeah, big we don't, factor. We don't need air yeah. either. We but have even, wow. yeah, even on the coast, when I lived at the beach, my light bill was typically about $65, $70, and we're running the AC every day, the dishwasher, which, washing, which coast, dryer. Which coast, <laughs> which coast was that, Celeste? Guanacaste. Oh. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's pretty cool. Okay, Will, do you want to just chime in just very, very quickly since they mentioned the, 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 the Black man factor? No doubt. I was over here uh, shouting as Khalil was talking about the changes because I experienced very much the same thing. So, you know, black men coming from the United States, uh, we were born and raised into an environment where they were trying to deny us access or kill us the entire time. Um, and one of the first things I noticed stepping off the plane in April of last year, I'm six foot two. You know, when I first came here, I was 300 pounds. I'm proud to say it. I'm down in my 260s now. Yes, it's getting, <laughs> we, we getting it in. We're walking on that center coast area every day. But um, as a six foot two large black man in the United States, I'm accustomed to being the first person that the police recognize when I walk into a room. I, I recognize you, you recognize me. We all know what's going on. All right. When I got off the plane here at Tucumán, there was a brother, you know, uh, one of the paramilitary police, national police with the uh, semi-autos standing at the end of the, uh, the gate terminal. And uh, he didn't even look my way. And that was the first clue. I'm like, that brother didn't see me. You know, and I, I got closer to him and I even hit him with the, you know, Buenos, who actually at that point is Buenadilla. And he's like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then driving um, so driving in the beach area Panama is really good about doing roadblocks every so often to do ID checks and especially uh, in the expat community I really think they were targeting people to make sure they weren't overstaying visas or whatever the case may be but any typical day I may run to the grocery store on uh, that, the main road in Coronado and run into a roadblock and once I rolled up, you know, all the windows are completely tinted out here. That's another another difference. There's no way in the world I could drive the car I drive here in Panama in the States. They would have killed me a long time ago because all the windows are completely tinted out. I didn't do that on my own, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to roll like that. But anyway, when I rolled up to the roadblock and put the window down, they're just like, keep it moving. <laughs> Look, and you, put I'm the, like, you put the window down, do like this. <laughs> right, 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 right. So the first time, the first time I'm in the roadblock, you know, I got my fingers, my thumbs underneath the steering wheel, fingertips pointed to the sky, you know, I've been trained, right? Assume the position. <laughs> Assume the position. And he's looking at me like, what's wrong with this dude? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the other roadblocks where they're just waving me through, I'm like, okay, this is what white people feel like in the United States. Wow. I get it. Wow. I, I actually that like part. the cops here. Right. That part. <laughs> I like wow. the cops here. And, you yes. know, they're very pleasant. Uh, I've, I've actually, let me go ahead and keep telling the story. I've actually had run, you know, I've been pulled over for speeding. Even that interaction was much better. Uh, the first time we were coming out of Panama City and they walked up, you know, we pulled over right after crossing the uh, Bridge of the Americas, going back to the beach. And they walk up on the right side of the car, which was a change right there. Because I'm used to, you know, the pulling out, stopping traffic. You know, let me put my hands out the window sometimes and all that. 
he never touched his firearm. He didn't, he didn't even get to that point. I'm, I'm reaching in the car, looking for passports, and at no point in time were they nervous or threatening. And the whole thing was just beautiful. So that peace of mind, uh, I definitely feel that as, as a black man, the best, the, the, not, not, uh, the lower stress levels, not uh, the lack of daily microaggressions, all of it. Just, it's, it's oof. you don't have to worry about stuff. The thing that I worry about now is when I log on to social media and I see the news feeds of all of my friends and family. And I'm like, I constantly, you sound depressing. You're constantly going through stuff, especially, you know, with these elections. Um, you know, I'm from D.C. I'm political. I got friends in Congress and all that good stuff. And seeing what they're talking about is just depressing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Will. I know it's, it's, it's that, that's a piece we can really get into, but mm -hmm. we, um, Devin, do you want to, you want to pick the next topic? Uh, let's do entertainment or. So what, so for, for uh, us here in Puerto Viejo, Costa Rica, which is on the Caribbean coast, um, it's pretty, it's very much a tourist town. Um, however, um, most of the tourists, particularly if you're into nightlife and going out to the bars, clubs, things like that, it's you're going to see a lot of, um, you know, white people in town, white tourists. Um, very few um, locals come out to the to the night spots, um, obviously, probably because the cost and the price of admission and drinks and things like that. But um, that's that's as far as the entertainment uh, goes here. We don't really participate in the nightlife here we 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 are more into the more intimate gatherings as someone's you know we've been invited to friends houses and uh having drinks there and things like that but as far as the scene here um we're from new york city there's never ever going to be a scene like it is in new york no. <laughs> been, no. there, been, been there been done there done that, that. Been that, there, that. But, for, but for costa rica that is a party town it is a it is a party. So town there, there are things into, all going on all the time it, down there. There are lots of there are lots of bars and restaurants and live music uh, venues and things like that. So it's a happening town. Right. Um, obviously, we we it's it's great because where we live is in Playa Negra, which is actually ten minutes from the town. So in in essence, we feel like we have the best of both worlds mm -hmm. because in Playa Negra which is in, located in the rainforest and the beach area, we have that. But if we want the nightlife and the hoopla and all of that, we just, we just got it 10 minutes away. So, um, but it's happening here and um, more and more uh, people are coming. Um, a lot of Europeans and things like that, they're the ones hanging out here in this town. There, there's also an age thing to, to make sure everybody understands here. The crowd that that lands on Puerto Viejo, the party crowd, they tend to be 20 and to 40, maybe, right? Something like that, yeah. right? Um, older folks, we don't like all that. So we prefer, <laughs> there are lounges that we go to, um, chic lounges where you just kind of chill with your friends. Kuka lounge. Uh, Kuka lounge, you know, there's stuff like that. Then there's, meet me at your house or I, you meet me at my house because a lot of the locals and we're slowly becoming locals and we're getting it too. We don't like all that because when they come and they land here en masse, they get their chest out because you know, when there's all of them together, they feel some type of way. Yeah. So I personally don't like that energy because it kind of triggers stuff from US and white boys just get stupid when they get, when they drunk. They just get yeah. stupid. But we don't want to be around that. So a lot of times, if you were to come here on a Saturday night where there's a lot of that going on, you can actually count on one hand how many melanated people you see. Because we just don't want that. And it's only one night, Saturday night, you know? And, but it's not that, it doesn't mean that we're home necessarily. We just don't want to be around that so we go away from that you know it's fun to a certain extent but uh once you're older you really don't want to deal with that you know a, a lot of a lot of times because it's they just get stupid and they remind you right? there's also there's also a very strong um black expat community presence here in puerto viejo 
And so there's, it's, it's a very kind of tight knit network. Um, and so the socializing happens within, you know, the black expat community. Yeah, we stick together. We and stick together. and yeah. so, you know, like I said earlier, you know, somebody may be hosting game night at their house and have some drinks and, yeah. and food and people come over. Every sat, uh, uh, occasionally once a month, actually, we get together for a beach party at Coclas Beach to yeah. celebrate people's birthdays in a month. Um, you know, things like that. So in terms of socializing, yes, you can socialize with expats. You can also go to town. But the locals is very intermixing and connecting. Yes. We have all places to hang out away from the tourists. Yeah. You know, away from that. Mm -hmm. But the tourists bring money, by the way. So we also understand that the local merchants, they benefit from all that. But even the right. local merchants will say to you, I can't wait till can, 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 can these people leave. Because it's, it's, you know, because it's an energy that is takeover energy you know? okay you know what i'm saying it, yes. yeah yeah a little, a little a little obnoxious that, so uh, yeah. I, I get it and so how about want, anybody yeah. else have um entertainment experiences well um, we're we, here oh go ahead will oh no i was gonna say that uh we turn up <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank <laughs> Just look at Will's page from the last bar crawl we did. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot to do. It just depends on what you like. Um, and I also like that you can go to like, if you want to go to the beaches, you can go to the beaches. Sometimes we'll get in a plane and, and fly out to Bocas. Um, it's just a lot of stuff to do. It just depends on, on what you like. But yeah, look, we, Will and I, are, we're 50, but I don't know. Right. <laughs> Right, you know, I, I, hear, I hear Khalil talking about, you know, <laughs> wanting to settle down the lounges and, and I'm there with you. I like a nice lounge yeah. and everything, but occasionally I like being the old dude at the club. So <laughs> yeah, um, you, you can do that, yeah. but here we prefer to do it with one another. Right. We don't like to do it with him and her because it's a whole different vibe they bring. It's a, vibe. It's a whole it's, different vibe. Yeah. First of all, she wants to hair, wear the headdress like the sisters. Oh, you know the headdress. <laughs> uh, yeah, Kalea, Kalea. Yeah, yeah. Now you gossiping, Kalea. No, no, no. You no, gossiping? It's not. It's very. I mean, they're smiling because they know I'm. They're smiling. <laughs> no, it's 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 very strange. You know, yeah. the, the appropriation <laughs> of the culture is so deliberate and so uh -huh. disrespectful. And they, you know, it's like black facing, you know, they just do it. Yes. You know, so we really don't want to be around that. There are places to hang out, but we prefer, you know. Um, I think that's understandable. Like, um, but in where we are, I don't, you don't really see that. Um, everybody that I see is like black and brown. I, I If I see a, a, a blonde hair, blue eyed person, we automatically know that they are not, <laughs> they're visiting or, you know, you don't really see that a lot. So when we go out, um, we don't get any strange looks or, and I mean, another thing I can address, like even when I'm out with my wife, like we, that was one of our big concerns. That's why we wanted to first move to Costa Rica because we're like, oh, they're a little more liberal. We don't know how that's going to look in Panama. And honestly, they don't pay us any attention. <laughs> you know, we 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 don't have to deal with what you guys are talking about. But well, see, put this real estate wise. They want this. Right. Mm -hmm. Like Oshin was saying earlier, the Limon province, which is the all the Caribbean <laughs> province, mm -hmm. you know, historically, this is where they kept the blacks. There was a time in, as far as the 1980s where we had to get an escort to go to San, a white escort to go to San Jose. You had to be escorted in and out, you know, and that ended in 1984. And you can still feel the remnants of that when you go to San Jose. So, but you know, black folk, we know how to turn nothing into something special. So we ended up making Limon, particularly Puerto Viejo, a very special magical place. See, now they want it, just like they wanted Harlem, just like they wanted Greenwich Village. It always goes down like that. But this time, we're not having it. So there's a little bit of that you'll pick up, you'll see, you know. But we, 
melanated people are coming, especially from US, we are buying land. And this is something that they just didn't expect. So there's a little tension going on. And the locals are like, oh, you look like me. So help me keep my culture. So that's bringing us, all of us together. So now it doesn't matter if you're from Panama, Costa Rica, Haiti, Jamaica, Harlem. It don't matter because this matters. Here, mm -hmm. this is king. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's and that's awesome. what we love. That's why we well, love. that also you you touched on a, another subject that we wanted to bring up was renting or buying. Who would like to share their experience with regard to renting or buying in Costa Rica or Panama? Who's renting? Who's buying? How easy was it? We're renting. I, I told you guys that already. Um, Kima in Guanacaste. Um, it was very easy. Um, that we haven't had any real issues i don't think um our property manager is super approachable and very responsive but we've also taken the opportunity to learn to do a lot of things ourselves so like some of the issues that we had year one if they happen now in year five we're like oh okay we don't make a phone call for it we just right we become very handy and self-reliant and so that's something else that i appreciate about the many gifts that I've been given from this this move is that um, it's you just become self reliant. Um, we were going to purchase. We we made some missteps. So now we always tell people rent first, rent first, and then purchase. And if we had to do it all over again, that's what we would do as well. Well, we're renting too. I'll just throw this in. We moved to two different places, and the thing that I find. The, the, uh, the nicest thing that I find about renting in Costa Rica is that there's no application. Mm -hmm. uh, there's never been an application for us and there's never been 20 people on the list. Whoever gets there first with the most money gets it. There's no fees for checking your credit and all this other kind of stuff. It basically, seems like it just kind of boils down to if the place is available and you have the money and you like the place and the guy likes you, then they give you a, a lease and you sign it. And the first lease that we had, our landlord gave it to us and he said, this is a standard lease, just cross out what you don't want. And, <laughs> and, we, and he told us to pick the number of years that we wanted to rent and pick that. And then when the time was over, he never came back to renew it or anything. The rent has just continued to be what it was. They've never raised it, never said anything to us about it. It's a joy. It's I love it compared to trying to rent in the Bay Area. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I have, I have to agree with you, Devin, that, uh, well, we, 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 we rented, um, but we also purchased. So we started our renting when we first got to Costa Rica in April. Um, just, you know, and it's very, fairly easy to rent. You can, um, I recommend waiting till you get to Costa Rica to ask locally on the ground, as opposed to looking at Facebook marketplace, things like that. I mean, you can find some deals there, but you can find better deals when you're on the ground and you can ask just your neighbors, the people on the block, hey, anybody got a place to rent, you know, kind of thing. And it's very simple. You just, as long as you got the cash, that's it. No application, no nothing. Sometimes you barely know their name. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so, but we did purchase land um, last year. We were just on vacation and, you know, through meeting people, one thing led to another. Next, we didn't even know we were, we were thinking about buying land, really. We didn't know that we could afford to buy land. And so meeting people, one thing led to another, and we purchased a piece of land. Then we just escalated. Our five to 10 year plan became like six months. We were out. <laughs> the, last time we were, the last time we were here, the last time we were right here was in September, and we moved here March 31st. At the time yeah. in September, we had a five to 10 year plan. We got back home and we said, let's do this now. Why wait? Why everything wait? Just, everything just kept happening. And you know when things are for you, um, right? Yes. It's, no, yes. it's effortless. Yes. It's fluid. Yes. It, things just happen. And that's the way it was happening. We're meeting people, getting this. We had the money. We, we, we just made it happen. And you know, it's still and, unbelievable. And, and I think and for us, we realized why are we waiting in the U.S. Right. when we want to be, when we already know where we want to be? So mm -hmm. if we're going to wait, 
wait means for retirement or whatever. Why don't we wait? Wait in Costa Rica. Right. And that's wait, that wait made, where it's warm. Yeah. Wait <laughs> where it's warm. Like, it just makes sense. Well, I should say wait where, where it's hot. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Terry, were you going to okay. say something? Yeah, I was going to say um, that I did purchase. So when I first came here, um, I stayed in a place for three months. And really, that was to see, do I even want to live in Panama? And if so, you know, is this the area that I want to live in? And I decided that I liked the building and um, just going down and hanging out in the pool and talking to residents. I found the place where I am now, which is in the same building, which is higher up. And um, I actually purchased, um, it, I did a lease purchase and then went back and um, put my house on the market. And the owners are um, Americans. And um, we, we met and we have a good relationship. It wasn't easy. And I think the reason it wasn't easy is because the owners had, um, a, a bad attorney who was basically keeping the thing drawn out so that she could make more money from them. And they were afraid to change because she had their power of attorney. Um, it should not have been as, as difficult as it was, but it was on their end. And so I, um, I had a six month lease purchase. And at the end of the six months, they were looking for the next month's rent. And I said, I sold my house. I'm ready to go. I don't see why I should have to pay rent anymore. And they said, well, if we tell you that you don't have to pay rent, then we're admitting that we hired the worst attorney in Panama. <laughs> like, you know, so I stopped paying rent until they closed. Wow. Mm -hmm. Charlotte, I think one lesson I learned um, about renting there is I didn't know how important it was to have a really good real estate agent. Um, I, I just, I didn't know that that was like very, very important. And so our first real estate agent, um, she really wasn't working for us. And that's, we wouldn't have ended up in that apartment if we would have had, you know, the apartment with the $2,000 power bill. Um, if we would have had a good real estate agent, she would have been able to speak to that and tell us that, no, you don't want this because of this or that. And so this time around, um, we used an agent that was hungry. He was well connected. He got us in buildings that we never saw any of these buildings when we came the first time. So I think that's um, important. As far as the procedure, it's a little, Panama's a little more conservative um, on some things. So we did, we, I did have to not, it's not really an application, but they call it like a client profile. And one issue we had is that people just could not wrap their heads around the fact that we didn't have nine to five jobs or a pension. And so that was, that was our biggest hurdle. I mean, we're giving, we're giving bank statements that says we could, we could pay for the whole year if we needed to. And so we can't figure out if that was the problem or that it, or if it, was that we are two women. Like we just couldn't really figure out what it was in a couple of a couple of places that people just flat out turned us down. And we're like, we why? <laughs> so <laughs> we did go through that like two times. We walk in and it's like they just sized us up. I don't, you know, Panamanians, like I said, they're very conservative. So I don't know if we just showed up in shorts and t-shirts. And I I mean, I I just don't know. But I do know it's very important to make sure you have good representation there. Yes. I'll say- And Panama is start. very conservative in that yeah. way. It's like, you can't, they don't expect you to go into government buildings with shorts or sandals. Right. You need to have closed, even to this day, you need to have closed toe shoes. You know, if you think yeah. you're rolling up on immigration, <laughs> you need to have on some clothes. That's yeah. interesting. To purchase, I just wanted to add, to purchase in Costa Rica, you don't need a real estate agent. You just, when we purchased our land, we just needed a lawyer. Um, same thing for buying a house. All you need is a lawyer. You don't need real estate person because that would just be another fee that you're paying. Uh, I don't think you have to have that here either. I just felt like as a new, as a person, like a new person coming into a country and not really knowing, I think you might have missed the part when I was telling them that I didn't know how important it was to have like energy efficient appliances and inverter air conditioners. And, and so I felt like 
as a new person coming in, my agent should have been the one to advocate for those things for me because I didn't know. And I, you know, I found it easier to, to navigate. Panama can be there. I mean, I love it there, but there are some things that, you know, you're, you got to pack your patience. And they so can get you know, petty. Panama, <laughs> gets, <laughs> Panama gets very petty. <laughs> they Panama really gets petty. very petty. And the, and the other thing too, when it comes to foreigners purchasing, the easiest thing is cash. You know, mm -hmm. uh, with regard to purchasing land in Panama, you got to be very careful because they have these serious right of possession um, things that happen and you can purchase land that's not properly deeded or titled and, you know, end up in a big mess. So you definitely need to have an attorney and a surveyor and all of that. And, and also when you build the new home, we built our home in Panama and I was blown away by the fact that there was no light fixtures. That just messed me up. We built this new house, brand new house. We closed, then we came here and I was like, it's not finished. <laughs> you know, wires was hanging everywhere. They didn't, it doesn't include light fixtures. It doesn't include air conditioned units. We did not know about the inverters and the, um, the, um, the savings either. But our electric bill, thank goodness, is not too bad. And it might be because my husband gets hubilado. But I think, I think on a, and I don't know, because he handles all that. But I think on like a, a high month, it might be 200. But we have three bedrooms, you know, and probably about four or five, you know, condition air conditioned units. So that was something interesting, I thought too, about buying. And they want you gotta give the seller 10%. You gotta give the seller 10% when you buy their house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, you do. And they have you gotta put down 10%, and then that seller actually has to pay that 10% in fees, you know. So it's a lot of fees in in, in the purchasing of a home here. And financing for foreigners is not easy to do. So your best bet is to come with cash. Yeah. I can speak on the financing for foreigners in Costa Rica. And so it's definitely come a long way. And so um, there are a lot of, and so to speak to Jay's point as to working with real estate agents and professionals um, that know about a lot of different programs, there are a lot of, um, communities we have here that will a let you pay your down payment over a year in payments um we're also starting to see some developments who are doing u.s mortgages with banks in miami so it's a lot of options that are coming over the past couple of years with the pandemic in costa rica interesting that's for new construction paying your down payment mm -hmm. within a year yes and it's typically 20%, but there are a few developments, especially there's a new one coming in on the Pacific coast in Liberia. So that's where the um, international airport is. They're building a new um, um, development there with a, a six acre crystal lagoon, seven man-made white sand beaches, a hospital, um, condos, a Marriott, it's just this big, <laughs> grand new. So it's it's been a pretty um, hot market for investors because the houses are in the 200s, 200,000s. So it's very affordable. Um, and they're going to be like the only price. So most, not most, all beaches right now in Costa Rica are public property, but these will actually be private because they're man-made. Wow. Okay. Um, healthcare. How y'all living? Quickly, I'm a veteran, and so um, there are quite a few um, clinics that will bill the VA directly for my care. Um, last year, I have a condition where food allergies, where my throat closes up, so I did have to fly to San Jose, and I was hospitalized for two days. Um, I felt like I had just given birth, was in a birthing suite, <laughs> so they didn't rush me out to the hospital. My husband was there. They gave him a bed. They fed us both days, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and I didn't pay a dime. Everything went to the VA. But you had to be flown from where you were. Well, I was initially on the coast still, and um, 
I didn't have any clinics set up there that worked directly with the VA. So I would have had to come out of pocket and be reimbursed. But in lieu of that, I just flew to the capital where I knew I didn't have to pay out of pocket. Nice. Anyone else on health care? Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, uh, so what was your name? Kima Nich and Nicholas. Nicholas. Go ahead, Nicholas. Okay, you said everything. The last thing we heard, you said everything has been out of pocket so far. <laughs> All right. Is that better? Yes. All right, fantastic. So everything has been out of pocket, what I stated. Um, we did, we had a childbirth. Here. So you had, you had a childbirth. The childbirth was very affordable? Yep, everything's been affordable. My wife had a little scare here with her blood pressure uh, once. Uh, she would love to tell the story. She's coming here in a moment. No, I heard you say, what happened? You got disconnected? Yes. Oh. Uh, we everything's been out of pocket, even with the high blood pressure uh, moment that we had and um, had to run to the hospital real quick. Everything was very inexpensive uh, here as far as health care. Uh, now, I always ask people inexpensive and affordable. Those are all very, she wants very that. subjective terms. Like, so give me some numbers. I'm no. So for having Nico. Um, Prenatal visits, we had um, three with a doctor that now was really important for being able to um, do our residency papers, like to register him. Um, we had to establish that I was in the country. So we saw an actual doctor, but then we paid a midwife and we ended up renting a home for seven weeks yep. in, in uh, San Isidro de General. So we could be close to a hospital just mm -hmm. in case I could be transported. But all in all, paying the doctor that said he was at the birth, even though he wasn't, um, the midwife, the prenatal visits, the postnatal visits, and I got mas uh, mastitis when he was like two days old. So I had to get antibiotics for that. It was like $3,200 mm -hmm. total for everything. Wow. No insurance. Including the apartment. Including the home, including yeah. renting the home for seven wow. weeks. It was that's okay. very that's very important for for U.S. you know citizens to to understand because yeah. when you think of healthcare, you just you can't you need them numbers because that's yeah. the only way you can put it in perspective. You know what yeah. I mean? And I had to wow. go to the emergency room. That's amazing. Room. Huh? I had to go to the emergency room. Um, I was having some issues with my heart. And I, I told you guys earlier, I had radiation on yes, over my yes. heart. So I was having issues on this side and just not feeling good. And I thought that that was coming back to bite me because there's a chance that I could have some heart issues or lung issues. Those, those are like long-term chemo like, um, side effects. Yes. So when I went, we went to the emergency room all the way to Liberia. We go to the emergency room. They took me back immediately. They, they gave me an EKG, um, a chest X-ray. They did um, a breast exam because they need to check the implant because I had a, 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 a unilateral mastectomy. They checked the implant. They did an ultrasound. And then she comes and she says, your blood looks good. You're, you're, um, you don't have anything going on. You're cancer free. They checked me for cancer. They did a cancer screening to make sure that I had, didn't have a recurring um, bout of cancer. And it was, she said, your blood pressure is sky high. Now I lost my baby sister and I wasn't able to go home. So I was under a whole lot of stress. Mm -hmm. And we think that had something to do with it. So she gave me some medication and I said, is, is there anything I can do naturally? Cause I really didn't want to take the medication. She said, yes. But then she said, and I didn't know anything about like high, low blood pressure. I've always been very healthy. She says, your blood pressure is so high that if you don't take the medication, I will have to admit you to the hospital. Your, your it's blood pressure, it was like 176 over 130 something. Just, I guess apparently she was surprised. The 176 got me. Yeah. So she said, take this. She gave me a 10 day supply of medication. She says, she said, drink coconut water. Um, but keep taking the medication and then follow up in, in two weeks, they wanted to follow up. So when I went to check out, I was nervous because I have no insurance and I know right. that in the States, this would have broken me. Right. Y'all, it was $156, <gasps> $156. And I was out of there. I walked through the door 
and I was out in what, an hour and a half, mm -hmm. 90 minutes. And that might be, and they did all of those tests and I had all of the, I still have the envelope in my room of the x-rays, the x-rays, wow. KG, all of the results she gave to me for me to take to my next doctor's appointment. Um, and so, and she gave me the, 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 the recommendation of a natural method. And so we looked up other natural methods and I did yeah. them all. My blood pressure is normal now. It's back normal. I'm not on any medication. I only took that medication for me. I didn't like the way it made me feel. So Ooh. I took it for maybe five days and then we just attacked it hard naturopathically. And it, within three months, it was back down to normal. That but is those awesome. Are the, those are the two experiences we had. And Nico got sick when we were in San Jose and I took him to the children's hospital and it was completely free, everything. And she told me that any child in Costa Rica, regardless of citizenship, can go to the children's hospital and be seen for free. They do not yeah. charge you to go to the, the, the children's hospital. Um, we followed up and went to Clinica Biblica because the medication they gave him, he had an allergic reaction to. And that still, they saw him on an emergency basis, did an exam, gave the medication. We paid 40 bucks and, and went home. So we've had- a that's, that's awesome. That's a, that's a game changer. And that's, a, that's good information for people from the States to- here. In, anybody else want to touch on healthcare? I'll, I'll, briefly, touch on, I'll briefly touch on ours. Um, just straight numbers. Andrea from um, Panama. From Panama. <laughs> yes. Um, straight numbers. I pay $1,600 a year for my health coverage, which allows me to travel up to three months in the States where I'll be covered there as well. And I, it's $360 a year per child. And we are 100% covered here in Panama. So that you that insurance you originated in Panama. In Panama, yes, it's a woo, and it covers you while you're traveling too. I, I can pay, yeah, woo. be up in the states for three months. That is awesome. Is that a special Panama policy? Yes. No. Yeah, I was going to ask the same question because I need <laughs> to, like I'm that looking for is... a good policy. Yeah. That's awesome. So it's funny that all of us are concerned about having some coverage when we go back to the States. <laughs> and that was my experience in corporate America whenever, you know, we had these large meetings and people came in from England or Germany or whatever. They were always complaining about having to get coverage just for the trip. Right. Trip insurance. Trip insurance. Exactly. It's, just, it's crazy. My experience right. in Panama, this is a big bill, by the way, in Panama. My experience with healthcare here has been uh, completely out of pocket, uh, and I'm floored with the difference in lower prices. My doctor's visit fee is less than my uh, doctor fee was in the states with the copay. It's less than my copay was in the states. So I had to get an MRI here, and I, you know, shoulder issue. I have rotator cuff surgery coming, and that I'm going to do here, uh, <laughs> um, but. It was in between us moving here, and I tried to get it initiated in the states, thinking, let me just go ahead and get this done while I still have this health care plan for my jobs, because both of us were going to leave our jobs in order to affect the move, and we knew that was going to kill our health care in the states. But what I was quoted in the states for that MRI was $725. What I paid for out of pocket here was $300. So, and that was with insurance. That was with my insurance, yes. So one of the last things, one of the last factors or, you know, things that sent us flying out of the States uh, was health care and how much money we were spending on it. So I just had a routine colonoscopy that was delayed for years. My doctor tried to get me to start at the age of 46 because Black men have a uh, higher incidence of, of colon cancer. So... Go ahead and get it done. I fought her for one year. But you were scared. <laughs> I was scared for one year because, you know, I knew it was coming, <laughs> but I still got time. I'm not 50 yet. Doc, you're going too fast, right? <laughs> and then my best friend's mother passed away from colon cancer. So that's what convinced me to stop playing around and get her done. My insurance company delayed me three years. They would not do the procedure because I wasn't 50 yet. They wanted me to pay out of pocket for it. And now the pocket numbers were outrageous. 
When I finally got it, they rescheduled me three times due to insurance reasons. I'm, I'm already taking the prep on one of the times. And then they called me and told me, don't, don't worry, you can eat. <laughs> I got a bill for $5,000 two months after my colonoscopy because it just so happened that the anesthesiologist was out of network now. I never talked to the anesthesiologist. The only thing I said to the anesthesiologist is when he walked in the room and asked me to count backwards from 10. That was it. it it's laughable to me that that kind of thing is so routine in the United States. So that, that was one of the last bills or gotcha moments that I experienced on my way here. And you know, I'm on the phone with the insurance company and they're trying to get me to negotiate with the clinic that did the procedure. And I'm like, that sounds an awful lot like your job. I pay you premiums for you to negotiate things <laughs> with doctors and, and to make sure that my anesthetist is in the network. So wow. none of that happens here. I'm also a fan of uh, what the young lady said of Costa Rica. The doctors here will do uh, natural remedies. I was pre-med in college, so I pay attention to that kind of thing. I pay attention to um, how doctors do the intake procedure. And like for the past 10 years in, in DC, I never spent more than five minutes FaceTime with my primary care physician. Here, I'm spending 45 minutes and they're asking me about my diet. They're asking me about my stress levels. You, you still work, what kind of work do you do? He even uh, yelled at me for carrying my book bag with the drone and all my camera equipment in it. He was like, you gotta get something to, to pull, like the kids get some. And that's something I never would have gotten in the States. You know, I was able to kick the bobo with him, ask questions. It's just a complete And they give you difference. their WhatsApp number. Yes, WhatsApp number, call me. Uh, you know, I was going through all kinds of stuff living in uh, Coronado, bumpy roads and bad furniture. So here's here's a little tip for Panama renters. A lot of stuff here comes fully furnished. Fully furnished means different things to different people. I'm a big dude. Panamanians aren't usually my size. So I'm moving in their apartments and their furniture doesn't fit me. And I'm thinking I have sciatica and everything. So they're running me through all these tests and I'm calling the doctor what's going on. It was the furniture, y'all. As soon as I moved from that Ooh. building. <laughs> as soon as I moved from that building, everything got fine. But, 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 but. Let me share this. I had four epidural shots during that time. <laughs> Living in Coronado, I, I was like getting hazed. I was pledging Coronado. I should, I should be in a fraternity or something. Wow. <laughs> well, it's it's important. Thank you so much for sharing. I I got sick one time here, and I uh, had to go to an urgent care. Um, I had some medication that they had to give me and it cost $53. And I was just like, wow. I mean, why would you even use your insurance? We're, we're military. So we have a hospital here that we can walk to that serves U.S. veterans. They accept our TRICARE. Um, my husband is um, disability, has disability, and he's done better with his disability here. They take better care of him here than than any experience he's had in the U.S. And so we've had a very positive experience. You know, praise God, I haven't really had to use, you know, too much um, health stuff, but it's good to know, it's good for people to know the differences. So we got to move on real quick. Um, the the um, Ocean, was you going to say something? I was just going to contribute to the healthcare conversation, but go ahead. We can move oh, on. Oh, no, no. Go ahead. Can, can you do it? Just do it real quick. I can so, just re so just really quickly, because one, one of the things that I hear often about living in Puerto Viejo on the Caribbean coast is the lack of um, healthcare facilities. So I had a little, you know, I went to the doctor uh, about three weeks ago. I had this itching stuff that came on suddenly. And I thought it was allergies because I do suffer from allergies back home. And so it, it, the itching just became more and more intense. So I just went to the doctor, to the local clinic here. I was seen, um, I just had to register, didn't have insurance or anything, um, had my vital signs taken. I was seen within 10 minutes of registering um, with a very personable doctor who spoke very fluent English and mm -hmm. Spanish. Um, and just the type of care also, he was really, asking me really took time to get to know me 
Um, and uh, the visit was $47, um, which in also includes a follow-up appointment visit. So for wow. $47, you you're, getting two doctors, do it. you're getting two doctor's visits. Um, I, had some blood test, do it. I had some blood tests done, a complete blood count um, and a chemistry, and that was about $40. Um, so I paid it all out of pocket. We're applying for residency. We don't have health care yet. But in the meantime, it's paying out of pocket. But I will say that if for more serious issues, you do need to go to San Jose. For example, if you needed a CAT scan or some type of, some type of imaging, like an MRI or something, you couldn't get it here. You have to go to San Jose, which is five hours from here, from where I am now. Wow. Okay. That's, that's something to consider. Um, thank you very much for sharing. And lastly, y'all, we have to do this again. We really do. We have to do this again. And this is going to be so good for folk. Um, if we could just speak briefly about education um, with the kids. Uh-huh. I'll start. So yeah, we. I looked, I, obviously the schooling and education was a big factor when looking here in Panama. Again, this is Andrea from Panama. Um, they have a wide range of educational opportunities for kids here um, in the city. I looked at the public schools and I mean the private schools and the international schools there. Um, costs range anywhere from $500 a month up to almost 36,000 a year. Um, so you have a big range of um, educational opportunities okay. in the city as well as, yeah. like I said, here in the uh, beaches area, there are <laughs> three big main um, uh, international schools. I pay um, now for mine, uh, they, my kids will both graduate from Panama with a US diploma as well as a Panamanian uh, diploma. And I pay uh, roughly for their education, their um, extracurricular activities of soccer, dance, guitar, um, only about $1,000 a month. That is pretty awesome. Can I ask you real quick? Somebody told me today, and I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't believe it, that you have to pay like a $75 or $100 a month for your kids to go to elementary school for public schools. Public, ever, yeah. Yes. Yeah, but public schools here, you have to pay, they have the uh, matriculation fee every year as well. And it's about, yeah, 75 to hundred dollars. So if you, if you don't have, if you're a local Panamanian and you don't have $75 or hundred dollars a month to send your kids to school, that's per child per month? No, no, not per month. No, not per month. No, that, that's usually just a one-time matriculation fee. And that includes their uniforms, their school books, and everything. That's not per month. A lot not of that per month, like maybe not per, per month, school year. Per school year, but for that, there are some Panamanian private schools because yes. here in Panama you have the Panamanian public schools, you have the Panamanian private schools, and then uh, international. And then international schools. So yeah, some of the Panamanian private schools are only about a hundred dollars per month. Okay, and that's not bad. I didn't think that was correct. I did and not my, think that was correct. And the school that my kids go to now is about 40 minutes away from where we live. And so oh. they take a school bus um, there. And again, that's a privately paid thing there. And I pay um, the school bus about $90. It's, it's still with everything, it's about a thousand a month. A thousand dollars a month about, yeah. That's awesome, that's awesome. Um, okay, thank you very much uh, for sharing. Did you want to share, Kima? Yeah, so okay. our daughter is, uh, she's at the Lice the high school now, the Liceo, which is 7th through 11th. And um, it's the public school. We, there is no, where we live, there's no private school. So when we moved here, she, she, it was after um, her school year ended in the States. But the school year here starts in February for the public schools. So she got a long summer. So when all of her friends went back to school in September, she came here and we started homeschooling. So we did homeschooling with some, with two other little girls. We would meet at the, at a beach house and we would do, you know, yoga and just 
life skills and things like that. And I was leading that for a little while and then they brought in another teacher, but then she started going to the public school and it's been a really good experience. When she was in elementary school, um, we went, she was in the fourth grade. We met the, they did like the, the group, I guess, welcome assembly. And afterward, the director asked us to stay and we met with the director, the English teacher, who, the man who was gonna be her teacher and the superintendent of the region. And they just wanted to make sure that we had everything we needed, that we had language support, that um, wanted to know that while Erilyn was getting acclimated to the language, she would have extra time on tests. And um, I think she could take her, she had a little dictionary that she could take to school and use. Um, she used it for maybe a month and then she really wanted to, I guess, not be different. So she stopped using it, but um, they were, I'm telling you, I, I just, I felt guilty for getting such support as the foreigner parent, the foreigner family, because I know that non-English speaking parents do not get the type of support that we got when she started school um, in the elementary school. And now she's in the high school and um, she's on the baile typical team. She's in the chess club. She's got lots of friends. They they're doing things. They went to on a field trip to San Jose to see the Diary of Anne Frank, like the play at the theater. And so um, her Spanish is on point at this point. And um, she's doing very, very well in her studies. I went to parent teacher conference uh, last month and they just raved about how disciplined she was. And I think that's just because of the way that school in the U.S. is. So and how she is, she's very disciplined and takes her studies very important but they are already talking to her about, you know, the possibility of her getting becas for university and, um, sorry, scholarships for universities and things like that. And so we've had a very, very pleasant experience with the public school system here in Costa Rica. Awesome. Celeste? Yes. Yeah, so I just wanted to speak on, um, just like the, so there, most of the private schools are bilingual. Um, Spanish and English, well, actually trilingual, Portuguese as well. Um, some of the schools require them to learn all three. So my husband and I, we just started the process of adopting his niece. So we actually found a school that is 80% English. So it's kind of like the reverse for her so that she can immerse in English and learn that way. <laughs> So there are like mostly English speaking schools here, if that's, um, you know, what parents want to ease their children into the transition. Um, and then also I would say like the quality of the education is just so much better. I have clients that moved from Atlanta in October and their kindergartner um, by January, he had learned how to read. Like he, mm. he was hiding it. They just kind of figured it out one day <laughs> where he just started reading stuff. So it's just like in that short of time, he had learned how to read. Celeste, so you or Kima might know. Do you know, is it legal to uh, for Costa Ricans to homeschool? For no. um, primary through sixth grade, no. No, okay. after that. Yeah. After so what I did, what I did when she was in elementary school before she started the main school, um, a friend of, of mine, she was married to a Tico and she had two children who are Tikas, um, but she didn't have them in public school. She created a school co-op. It was like a loophole around the homeschooling. So that's what we did uh, um, yeah. until Erilyn started the regular school. Erilyn, it, I let it be her decision. If she wanted to stay in like the school co-op thing, she could, but she was really excited to go to school and meet other people and just really learn the culture and immerse. And to Celeste's point, the quality of education is really good. I have people ask me all the time, like, like, I don't know what they think. I don't know what they think. Program, they've been programmed to think that the U.S. is the best. But right. she, that they are really challenging her. Um, and she's learning some things that I wasn't introduced to until like the ninth grade. Um, and so, um, and she's, they're reading good books and the class sizes are smaller. I think that's also really important. Um, where in the U.S., her class size is range anywhere from 22 to 26 and here she's in the largest 
that she's been now, it's like 20, how many of y'all is it? 20 what? 28. But she, but they have like six classes. So they, they rotate, but it's 28 seventh graders. But when she was in fourth, fifth and six, it was like six, six of them four you know, five to six okay. of them. Real quick, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Devin. Um, what is a tika or a tico? <laughs> Sorry, a tika is a Costa Rican girl, and a tico oh. is like a Costa a Costa Rican person. But they refer to themselves. Yeah, as... they refer to themselves as ticos or ticas. Okay, I figured it was male because <laughs> of the I O, but I, I yeah. was trying to figure out what is a tika or a tico. You know, yeah, I was saying people yeah. that are in this whole international world. You just get to the point where you think everybody you know. know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know but how thank I'm you. Scared. Thank you so yeah. much. That was awesome. Devin, yeah. I'm going to turn this over to you. Yes, I want to thank everyone for coming on the call today and sharing your story and your experiences. It has been uh, quite uh, interesting and very informative. And I really think this is going to be helpful to other people who are thinking about moving to Costa Rica or to Panama to kind of get an idea of what life is like in both of those countries. Because I've noticed that a lot of times when people are considering where to go, they always have Costa Rica and Panama on their list. And usually you have to end up making some decision between, you know, between the two of them. So this gives you kind of a, a brief overview really of some of the differences. You can pick what you think is the most important thing to you and you know, maybe make your decision based on that. The other thing I wanted to say, if any, if any of you have businesses or websites or anything that you would like to share, uh, let me know now you, for the radio. You can just give it uh, audio here, uh, your website, your contact information or whatever. And then when it goes to video, I'll print it in the uh, description box. So anybody wanna share? Websites, business. Why don't we start at the top? You, you can say yes or no, and then we'll go down and everybody can share. Go ahead, Celeste. Yeah, again, Celeste Lawson. You can find me on all social channels at Melanin Tours. That's M E L A N I N Tours, and also melanintours.com. Okay. Next. Either. Uh, Terry or Andre, okay, Will? Uh, yeah, this is Big Will for Big Will TV. You can find me on YouTube at, at Big Will TV and Facebook is the exact same thing, at Big Will TV. That's definitely the best way to get in contact with me. Okay, anyone else? Um, <laughs> sorry, you can, you can see some of my um, photographic work at, on Facebook at Puerto Viejo Through My Eyes. Anybody else? And mine is, um, uh, this is Andrea Broussard from Panama. I have an educational consulting um, company and it's Briar Consulting, B-R-I-L-L-A-R consulting.com. And I, I'm at Unplugged CR and it's Unplugged CR.com, www.unpluggedcr.com. And that's how you can find me on Instagram as well. And, um, and yeah, that, and you can find all this stuff. I build websites and do tours and teach English. Okay. Well, both um, Charlotte and I will be running the, uh, the round table on our Blacks at Radio shows. Uh, Charlotte has given us, yours is on Sunday, what Charlotte? 2 p.m. Costa Rica time. Uh, this is it, it's Saturdays. Uh, from uh, 12 noon to 1 p.m. Costa Rica time. But I will be posting the air date to the uh, Blacks, Black Expats in Costa Rica Facebook page. So you'll Devin. know, and then after that, I will also post for the YouTube for, the YouTube for, my, for my group. So hey, Devin, questions. I just wanted to mention um, our um, IG page is Tyler's Out Loud. Um, my wife and I are starting to document our travels throughout Central and South America. Um, right now, we're actually in Cartagena, Colombia. So oh, we're starting. Uh, I'll be there on the 30th. Huh? I'm in Cartagena. I'll be in Cartagena on the 30th. Oh, wow. I love this place. So, yeah, we're starting to document because we're getting a lot of people, just a lot of interest that they just right. didn't know you could do this. So right. follow us on, on our IG travel page. 
One, and, and, and this is Terry. This is Terry. I want to say um, one more thing. I am in an organization called El Proyecto Phoenix. I'm on the board there. And mm -hmm. it is um, a couple of, of sisters from the U.S. who have founded an organization to um, improve the lives of the neediest families in our area. And um, we have a Facebook page, El Proyecto Phoenix, F-E-N-I-X, uh, Panama. And we're gonna have a big gala in December. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'd like people to take a look at that. It's December 18th? December 13th, and it's 13th. here in the beaches area in Coronado. Thank you. Wonderful. Charlotte? Hey, well, I'm now Charlotte. Goodbye. <laughs> Charlotte. Uh, yeah, just, okay. you know, Panama. thank you everybody for coming. Um, and I will be, um, I will be broadcasting this on our, our radio show and also eventually on YouTube. So stay tuned. Let me tell you, the information that you all shared today is invaluable. And I hope that we can get together and do it again because as you can see, we could have kept talking. I know, we could have gone on to six o'clock. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good, good evening. Bye-bye. Adios. 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 Ciao. All right, my dear. That's a wrap. We are wrapped up. That's two in one week. Oh, boy. I know. Oh, my God. Woo. That was good. That it was, was really good. We, this could have gone longer. It's true. It, it could have been. Yes. You know, it's just so much. It and, is. You know, everybody is so forthcoming. I know, which is so great. You just know? never know how forthcoming folks are going to be. We could have gotten a lot more deeper into uh, the Black experience. Exactly. Uh,